sports are breeding grounds for conspiracy theories, and these are the NBA's craziest over the years. 1985 NBA Draft Lottery The NBA Draft Lottery is meant to be one of the most random events in all of sports, as its name alludes to, but that may not have always been the case. Heading into the 1985 draft, there was a consensus number one overall pick in Patrick Ewing. The big man out of Georgetown was billed as the league's next superstar, with the ability to carry the weight of a franchise on his broad shoulders. Back then, one envelope for each team in the lottery was placed in a transparent ball, and NBA Commissioner David Stern would pick them out. There are two Two leading theories to how Stern went about rigging this. The first involves a creased corner on the Knicks envelope, and the second is that the Knicks one was frozen ahead of time. Either ploy would have very subtly let Stern know which envelope belonged to New York. Adding more cause for suspicion, the accounting firm in charge of the lottery, Ernst & Whitney, was the auditing firm for Gulf & Western, who owned the Knicks. It was even an Ernst & Whitney employee who put the envelopes into the ball. So, why would Stern and the league care about this? With New York being one of the biggest market franchises, the Knicks being competitive would do wonders for television ratings, and the NBA just so happened to be working on a new TV deal at the time. At the time, Stern did didn't even deny allegations, saying, If people want to say that it was fixed, fine. As long as they spell our name right, that means they're interested in us. That's terrific. Reflecting on the claims it was rigged, Ewing's agent David Falk said, I'm not saying it happened, and took a long dramatic pause before adding, but that theory is plausible. Rigged or not, the NBA came out a winner, as Ewing quickly lifted the Knicks out of the Eastern Conference cellar and into consistent championship contention. Why MJ first retired there's a difference between going out on top and retiring during one's prime, especially when it involves one of the most competitive athletes of all time. In October of 1993, Michael Jordan shocked the sporting world by abruptly retiring from the NBA. He had just led his Bulls to three straight titles and was coming off winning an Olympic gold medal with the 92 Dream Team, in addition to passing on a chance to etch his name in NBA history by winning four straight rings. MJ also chose to hang up his shoes after a season in which he averaged 32.6 points. 6.7 rebounds, and 5.5 assists per game. There's no debating Michael had plenty left in the tank, and just as much to play for. But at that time, Jordan cited a lack of desire to play the game, stemming from his father's death three months earlier. However, what some think actually happened was David Stern and MJ came to an agreement behind the scenes, where Jordan would serve a secret one-year suspension because of gambling problems. What was not secret was that MJ was just as competitive off the court with bets as he was on it, except he he didn't experience nearly the same level of success. Some of his absurd gambling losses have been well documented, like when a businessman wrote a book claiming Jordan owed him over $1.25 million from lost golf wagers. The theory is that Stern believed the NBA's image was so fragile and important at the time that having its star player being depicted as a degenerate gambler would severely hurt the league. So, he told Michael to take a year to clean his act up before returning as a hero to save the Bulls. The Morris Twins at some point in everyone's life, they have met a pair of identical twins who they can't always tell apart. A pair of NBA twins may have used this to their advantage in the playoffs. In Game 1 of the 2017 Eastern Conference Semifinals, the Wizards' Markeith Morris suffered what appeared to be a severe ankle injury. He left the game and didn't return before miraculously recovering for Game 2, where he showed no signs of the injury, while putting up 16 points and 6 rebounds in 26 minutes. It was the best Markeith had looked all playoffs. This left people wondering whether or not it was really Markeith out there, or if Marcus, whose season was already over with the Pistons, had stepped in acting as his brother. The similarities in their playing styles and jump shots are almost as striking as their physical appearance. Although it's crazy to consider them attempting to pull this off, it actually wouldn't be the first time they pulled this stunt. They did it one time while playing AAU basketball. When they were kids, Markeith had fouled out of a game, and then Marcus hurt his ankle, so they quickly swapped jerseys on the bench without anyone noticing. 2002 Western Conference Finals, Game 6. While fans routinely blame their favorite team's losses on the refs, sometimes there's enough to the story that even impartial fans find it to be foul play. Heading into Game 6 of the 2002 Western Conference Finals, the Kings held a 3-2 series lead over the Lakers. The Kings were one quarter of basketball away from heading to their first NBA Finals since 1951. With the game tied, the referees decided to delay Sacramento's return to the Finals, at least another game. In the fourth quarter of Game 6, the Lakers shot 26 
seven free throws, compared to the Kings' nine, as LA went on to win by four points. One particular moment from the game sticks out, where Kobe Bryant shoved and elbowed Mike Bibby, but a foul was called on Bibby, thus denying the Kings of a chance to tie the game. Although the free throw discrepancy in that play were topics of conversation at the time, it was nothing more than just talk. There was no hard evidence the game was rigged, so that the Lakers would win and force a Game 7. However, in 2008, that all changed when former NBA ref Tim Donahue alleged in a court filing that two of the three officials from that game went out of their way to determine its outcome. Donahue claimed the refs were instructed by the league to prolong the series in any way necessary. Upon hearing Donahue's allegations years later, King center Scott Pollard, who fouled out during Game 6, said, My first thought was, I knew it. I'm not going to say there was a conspiracy. I just think something wasn't right. It was unfair. We didn't have a chance to win that game. The league's reason for forcing a Game 7 involved money, just like almost every decision they make. The TV revenue from the additional game, and also the chance that one of their biggest markets in LA returned to the finals, instead of a small one like Sacramento, was worth risking their reputation. The Flu Game Although basketball fans know exactly what game and performance those three words refer to, they may not be accurate. Game 5 of the 1997 NBA Finals involved one of the most iconic performances of all time by Michael Jordan. As the story goes, MJ led his team to a victory on the road over the Jazz. After having thrown up all night before the game and needing to be hooked up to IVs in the Bulls' locker room, Jordan was so drained after Game 5 that he couldn't even speak to the media, yet he still managed to play 44 minutes and score 38 points, including hitting the game-icing shot. While MJ was obviously very ill, it wasn't exactly clear what the cause was at the time, but then NBC sports broadcaster Marv Albert before the game reported Jordan was experiencing flu-like symptoms, so the name and story took off from there. In 2013, MJ's trainer Tim Grover recounted what happened the night before the game and confirmed a growing suspicion that it developed. Grover said Jordan had ordered a pizza late night before Game 5. He described how five people showed up to deliver it, which gave him a bad feeling at the time about the situation. Grover confidently asserts that it was food poisoning, not the flu. In the Last Dance documentary, MJ admitted to eating the pizza, implying it was food poisoning. But the question remains, was it intentionally done? Did some local jazz fans take matters into their own hands and try to help their team win a title? It was well known where the Bulls were staying at the time, and five people showing up to deliver a pizza late at night is far from normal behavior. Chris Paul Trade Veto in 2011, a trade was agreed to that would have paired one of the best all-time point guards with one of the most feared scorers. But it didn't go through, potentially because of spite. The New Orleans Hornets and the Los Angeles Lakers agreed to a blockbuster deal centered on Chris Paul joining Kobe Bryant in the purple and gold, but David Stern ended up vetoing it. At the time, the league owned a majority stake in the Hornets, as the franchise sought out a new owner. Because of that, Stern technically did nothing wrong and had the right to veto a trade, but his reason for doing so might not have been ethical. While Stern claimed he was protecting the Hornets and had their best interests in mind, others viewed it to be a perfectly legitimate trade. The Hornets would have received plenty of talent in exchange for CP3. Stern supposedly ran the trade package by an ex-general manager at the time, who said that it would have been enough to make the Hornets a playoff team. Having denied fans the chance to see such a dynamic and exciting pairing in CP3 and Kobe, in what seemed to be a fair trade, Stern and the league faced plenty of scrutiny. The theory is that Stern wanted the Hornets to appear more attractive attractive and valuable to prospective buyers, so they needed a star player like CP3 on the roster. The Hornets' post-trade would have been good, but not good enough to drive up the franchise's value. While CP3 was then traded to the Clippers just a few days later, the Clippers deal included a first-round pick that was likely to be one of the first picks of the draft. This was something that Stern could use to sell potential buyers on. The pick ended up becoming the first overall selection, which was used on Anthony Davis. Still think the draft lottery is random? 2014 NBA Finals Game 1 Playing mind games with opponents is nothing out of the ordinary in sports, but sometimes teams can toe the line in the process. In Game 1 of the 2014 Finals between the Spurs and Heat, an electrical failure at the Spurs AT&T Center led to the air conditioner failing and the building reaching temperatures in the 90s. While this theoretically would impact both teams, one star player was more prone to feeling greater effects than anyone else. LeBron already had a well-documented history of cramping in big games. He first experienced this in the 2000s 
2009 Eastern Conference Finals before suffering from it again in the 2012 Finals. In 2012, the cramping got so bad that LeBron had to be carried off the court by Juwan Howard. He kept having to leave Game 1 against the Spurs due to cramping before eventually sitting out the final four minutes. Spurs players, on the other hand, seemed unbothered. Tony Parker said, Felt like Europe. We never had AC in Europe, so it didn't bother me at all. Manu Ginobili added, I've played more years in situations like this than with AC on the court. Not a big deal in that case. So, did the Spurs go out of their way to try to trigger another series of cramps for the King, knowing their players could handle it? Or did they just benefit from a random occurrence? Either way, they took full advantage of LeBron sitting out the final four minutes of the game, going on a 16-3 run over that period to take a 1-0 series lead, the Heat's Big Three. What was meant to seem like a spontaneous decision made on national TV may have been the result of years of scheming by three friends. In 2010, when LeBron decided to take his talents to South Beach with his infamous nationally televised ESPN event labeled The Decision, his move to form a Big Three with Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh was meant to seem like a surprise. In reality, though, it all began in 2004, when LeBron, D. Wade, and Bosh played as teammates on the U.S. Olympic team. The trio supposedly hit it off immediately. And and loved playing together, but they were under contract with three different NBA teams at the time, so it was nothing more than a summer fling. Then in 2006, the Big Three showed their cards some, as they all signed extensions for the exact same length with their respective teams. Once those contracts expired in 2010, they joined forces in Miami, forming a polarizing super team. While the group attempted to play it off as a coincidence, Knicks superfan Spike Lee wasn't buying it whatsoever. Lee said, this is nothing but a pure Corleone gangster move. It was laid out. This didn't happen by happenstance. They made people look like idiots. They had the thing planned out two years ago. Cavs owner Dan Gilbert agreed with Spike and decided to look into tampering charges against the Heat and LeBron. 